Good morning, everyone, and welcome uh, together with Starkweather and Shepley. I would like to thank you for joining us today. We're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Ashley Brown, and I'm a senior manager on the marketing team at KLR. Together, we are facing a truly unprecedented situation that is affecting all of our families, our businesses, and our communities, and especially our way of life. KLR, Starkweather and Shepley, KLR Wealth, KLR Executive Search, KLR Outsourcing, and Envision Technology Advisors, our sister companies, are all here to partner with you through this difficult time. So today's webinar is an update on the CARES Act. We are going to be diving into the Paycheck Protection Program loans, uh, the forgiveness calculation, and the impact insurance can have on your business during these times. Our discussion today will be focused on the immediate issues facing small businesses. And we received all of your questions that you submitted when registering. We're going to try and answer as many of them as we can today. So Anthony Mandarelli is here today. He is a partner at KLR and the director of the KLR Enterprise Solutions Group. He has been following each and every update on the CARES Act and will give, be giving an update on the changes to the PPP that you need to be aware of since our last webinar and diving into the loan forgiveness calculation, how that works now that many of you have submitted your applications. Sean Cottrell is a senior vice president and human services healthcare practice group leader for Starkweather and Shepley Insurance, SNS as we like to call them. Sean's responsibility to the firm includes being a member of the sales management team, a mentor to multiple practice groups and different Starkweather offices. Uh, Sean uses his commercial insurance expertise to assist clients nationally with their insurance programs and risk management needs. So just as a reminder, a link to a copy of the slides and a recording of the webinar will be sent out via email after the presentation. And I'm going to turn it over to Anthony and Sean. Good morning, guys. Good morning. Thank you, Ashley. And uh, thank you for all that you have done to make this webinar a reality. And uh, thank you all for attending. Uh, we at KOR presented an overview of the CARES Act webinar back on April 2nd. And if you have not seen it, encourage everybody to visit our website for the uh, the link to watch it and uh, by far that was the most watched webinar we've ever presented in uh, in our history and early indicators is that uh, we may reach and, and surpass those numbers today uh, because I think there's one common theme is that we're all in this together um, so you know this crisis has forced us to embrace innovation and that means I'm speaking to you from my my kitchen table and everyone else on the line here has uh, been speaking to you from their, their respective residences. We have not been in contact with each other. It's, we're, we're practicing social distancing, and I've practiced one thing, and that is uh, good teams work together, not necessarily in the same uh, roof, under the same roof. So we're, uh, we're excited at KOR today to partner with Sean and the team at Stockworther and Shepley. And the um, question I keep getting is, why insurance along with the Paycheck Protection Program review? And, you know, we have been focusing on answering the questions that our clients don't know they have yet. And our friends at Starkweather and Shepley are practicing the same principle. And in speaking with Sean and his team, the items they're going to cover to get today are, are sure to pay dividends down the line. You know, because we keep getting asked questions on business interruption insurance workers' comp and liability now that people are working from home, and future premiums. And, you know, I'm excited to say that, that Sean is an expert in that arena, and he'll be speaking to those topics as I'll be speaking to the forgiveness factors within the Payroll Protection Program, or PPP. So I tell everybody to strap yourself in. We've got some riveting information to go. So as you can see, our, our agenda, um, the way it's going to work, I'm going to speak about PPP. Sean will speak about the insurance component, and then we're going to get to some questions. I'll, I'll let everybody know we had many, many questions come in. We're going to try to get to as many as possible at the end, and in the event we can't, we'll, we'll look to post answers to those questions on our website. I can't stress enough that the CARES Act was written very quickly to combat the economic downfall that happened overnight, so there's lots of inconsistencies. And while the Treasury and the SBA has addressed a lot of the vagueness and the inconsistencies in the calculating the loan amount and the eligibility to participate in the PPP. There is much more to come as it relates to the forgiveness formulas. So we're going to go over a common sense approach today based on the, the intent of how the forgiveness should work. 
And I can't stress that maybe in an hour from now, the formula could look very different. Uh, but we thought it was important and timely to, to give you certain items to consider and work through the formula the way it's written today, because we're seeing a lot of the funds start to get dispersed. So as a quick refresher, what is the Payroll Protection Program? It's a, a loan program that's designed to provide a couple months of payroll and necessary operating expenses to be covered by the, the government. And the key provision within this program is that if you use the money in the way that it's allowed to be in the CARES Act, you can get forgiveness on the loan. And you need to use those funds prior to June 30th. That's, that's important to stress. Now, the other thing to stress is you're reading a lot in the papers and the news today about companies that are very large that receive funding under the PPP. You know, you had to stress that you needed to meet certain rules to obtain that funding, including that you had to certify that your business was impacted by the uncertain economic conditions as a result of COVID-19 and that you needed these funds to maintain employment levels and maintain keeping the doors open. So I, I can't stress enough that you have to certify to that when applying to the program. And as we know, eligibility was for profits and not for profits that employed less than 500 individuals. That 500 individuals was part time, full time. Uh, it wasn't carved out for either, but there were some other alternative formulas you could apply under where you may have had in excess of 500 individuals as employees and still obtain funding under the program. Um, how much could I borrow? It was based on the prior 12 months of payroll, in most cases your 2019 payroll, and you were able to borrow approximately two and, two and a half months of payroll. And when we say payroll, it included other costs such as health insurance, retirement plan contributions, and state and local taxes assessed. And the max loan under the program was $10 million. And when we designed today's webinar, it was based upon forgiveness, but what we saw happen was there were many companies that got shut out of the initial funding round that closed last week. Um, so we've been getting a lot of questions as to what do we recommend to those that did not receive funding. And I can't stress enough that uh, there's going to be a second round of funding, it looks like, this week. And the thing you should do is the way the process works is you you go to your bank's platform, you apply, you provide a lot of proprietary information based upon payroll and the amount of loan. And I can't speak to the banking side, but what I can tell you I see is that the bank pulls the information in, it goes through a QC department, and it needs to go through underwriting at the bank. And then the bank approves the loan at the underwriting level. When that happens, the loan is then submitted to the SBA to get a guarantee. And when the SBA approves the guarantee, what's called an ETRAN number is released back to the bank. And the ETRAN number is best described as Willy Wonka's golden ticket. When you have your ETRAN number, that kind of guarantees you your funding. And then the bank will execute a promissory note with you. And um, once the promissory note is executed, the funds will hit your account. You have eight weeks to start assessing for forgiveness. So if you haven't received your funding today, the biggest thing I can stress is contact your lending institution, your banker, make sure your loan is through the actual underwriting process and ready to go to the SBA for that ETRAN number. So once you get your funding, uh, what can you use the loan proceeds for? And companies can use the proceeds for eligible payroll costs, which are payroll, retirement plan contributions, health insurance, state and local tax is assessed on payroll, as well as the interest on mortgage obligations on real or personal property, rent payments, utilities, interest payments on other debt obligations, and refinancing of the economic injury disaster loans received through the SBA uh, between the dates of January 31st and April 3rd. Uh, keep in mind for mortgage is debt, uh, rental agreements and utilities, they had to be in place prior to February 15, 2020. So you can't take these funds and enter into 
uh, a new agreement and use these funds to fund those agreements. Now, early rounds of funding are coming out, and one of the biggest stresses we're seeing is that within the loan promissory documents that the banks are putting forward, it states that 75% of the PPP loan proceeds must be used for eligible payroll costs. And when I stress that people are getting excited, it's because they believe that if they don't spend 75% of the loan for payroll costs in the eight week period, then they get no forgiveness. Uh, I can't speak to each individual bank. What I can tell you is what is in the CARES Act says that um, 75 percent of the funds shall be used for payroll costs so you can use them for payroll costs but when calculating forgiveness the interim final rules state that 75 percent of the amount forgiven must be used for payroll costs so there's, there's a difference between shall be and must be so you have to use 75 percent of the funds for payroll costs but to get forgiveness, you must use 75% for payroll costs. So I, I, and we'll look at this in a little bit. I think that there's a, there's a component there that we have to understand that you can still get forgiveness, but your forgiveness is limited um, to 75% of what's used from the loan proceeds for payroll costs. Additionally, you can pay interest on certain debt with the proceeds, but if it's not a mortgage that has uh, real or personal property encumbered by it, you can't use that interest payment in the forgiveness formula. So we're going to de determine the forgiveness in three steps. And I have to stress once again, additional guidance will be coming out from the SBA. We're currently using the original CARES Act. The interim final rules that were published on uh, the U.S. Treasury's website, there's three interim final rules, although really the second one was a guidance on affiliation. So there's really interim rule one and interim rule three that we're really looking at here, as well as a frequently asked questions publication. Additionally, amounts forgiven under the PPP are not to be included in taxable income. There's a lot of discuss discussion about whether or not the expenses that you pay with these loans will be uh, eligible for deduction on your tax return. I caution everybody that Internal Revenue Code Section 265 may apply where it says you have no deduction allowed for expenses that are attributable to tax exempt income. So stay tuned. So how do we count forgiveness? Well, forgiveness starts with the eight week clock of expenses. And I tell you that the expenses that you pay in those eight weeks can be put into two buckets. Bucket A is eligible payroll costs. And that's gross compensation paid to your employees not to exceed a $100,000 annual cap rate per employee. As well as employer payments for healthcare, our employer retirement plan contributions and payments of state and local taxes assessed on compensation. Originally, the guidance was written such that it was based upon net payroll, and that is the only item on the forgiveness factor that the SBA and the US Treasury has addressed because there was a big concern with the fact that that would lead to about a 30% swing in your forgiveness formula if the forgiveness was based on net payroll. That was addressed in frequently asked question number 16. I'd like to see something a little bit more authoritative than a frequently asked question, but it does state there that it's gross payroll. Bucket B is your non-payroll cost. And generally speaking, that's your interest on mortgage obligations incurred before February 15, 2020, rent payments on leases before February 15, 2020, and utility payments. This is for forgiveness, not eligible cost you can use the money on. Keep in mind, you are paying your employer FICA component on the payroll that you pay during this period. So people keep saying to me, should I bring my employees back to get forgiveness? You really have to assess it because you will have to cover out of pocket the employer FICA component, which is 7.65% in most cases of payroll. So how do we calculate our eligible forgiveness expenses? So 
as I stated earlier, your, your eligible payroll expenses, your eligible payroll costs have to be 75%. So you take in that eight week period what you spend on eligible payroll costs and you divide it by 0.75. You then add buckets A and B together, and we'll look at this in a minute in an example. And if um, your maximum allowable expenses when added together in A and B are less than the payroll cost divided by 0.75, you move on. If they are not, you have to reduce your eligible non-payroll cost in bucket B such that your eligible deduct your eligible forgiveness expenses is 0.75% of your eligible payroll cost. And we'll look at that in an example which will make things a little clearer. So now some considerations that keep coming in. And as I said, there's not answers yet, and these are the questions you should be paying attention to. Um, everyone knows the difference between cash basis and accrual basis. So within the CARES Act, under the forgiveness formula, it says you include costs incurred and payments made during the covered period for these expense inputs in bucket A and bucket B. And I would stress that word and. So the question I keep being asked is does that word and in the CARES Act sentence mean one or the other must be present for the costs to be included in the forgiveness formula or um, both must be present? And that is really the cash versus the accrual because when you think about it, for instance, in an eight week period, you'll have employees work in week eight, but you pay them a week in arrears, so really you're not paying them till week nine can you include that eighth week of payroll within the forgiveness formula? So stay tuned, but that'll be a big concern for most people as they calculate forgiveness. Additionally, we look to the CARES Act and preceding the interest rent and utility payments component within the non-payroll bucket, it uses the term any payment. So, the question we've been asked is, can a business pay delinquent expenses? Because in many cases, businesses haven't paid their March and April rent. And can you pay those expenses with PPP funds and still get forgiveness? Because in theory, in the eight-week period, that wasn't a cost incurred in that eight-week period, but it was a cost paid because it was incurred prior to that period. Watch for the guidance to come out. Um, but that's a big question, and it goes back to cash basis versus accrual basis. So what's included in rent? Business rent payments. And the examples reference the warehouse where you store your business equipment or the vehicle you use to perform your business. What you can see there is early indications where rent payments were for lease premises only, but the guidance in Interim Rule 3 specifically states vehicles. Um, can businesses prepay expenses? Once again, there's no reference to scheduled monthly or normal cost of business when describing the non-payroll cost. So can you prepay your July rent and still get forgiveness for it? I'd say stay tuned, but these are the questions you need to um, watch for answers to. So what's included in utilities? Uh, in interim final rule three, it references cost of electricity, but it also references uh, gas you use for driving your business vehicle. I personally don't consider gas to be a utility, but if we're reading what interim final rule three says, it looks as if gas may be considered a utility by this rule. And therefore, if you've got a fuel of delivery vehicles, not only will you be able to get the rent deduction for forgiveness uh, for when you pay for your lease vehicles on a monthly basis, you may also be able to get the fuel payments eligible for forgiveness. On the interest component, it's payments of interest on mortgage obligations on real or personal property. Uh, notice that it doesn't say tangible personal property. I'm not going to go through that rabbit hole, but if you understand what that means, it means that your business could benefit greatly. So once we determine the eligible expenses for forgiveness, we go through the reduction adjustment. If your headcount has gone down, it's a percentage formula where as the numerator is the average number of full-time employees for the eight-week period within the uh, forgiveness divided by at your election 
the lower number. You want the lower number here. So it's either the average number of full-time equivalent employees from February 15, 2019 through June 30, 19, or the average number of full-time employees from January 1st, 2020 through February 29, 2020. So you calculate your eligible forgiveness expenses and then you multiply them by this formula. The question that's come up is when calculating the full-time equivalency employees, is that calculation based upon a 40-hour standard work week or the 30-hour work week as designated under the Affordable Care Act? We tell you stay tuned for guidance, but for now, I would calculate your projected forgiveness formula using both methods. And you cannot increase your formula um, you cannot increase forgiveness under this formula, so if your employees in the eight-week period are higher than what they were in these previous two pre-pandemic periods, and your, your percentage is over one, you, you can't um, increase forgiveness here. So once you calculate your first component of headcount reduction, you go to the second component, which is a salary reduction adjustment. And the way the CARES Act reads is that the loan forgiveness amount um, is further reduced for any reduction in salary or wages for an employee who earns, earns less than 75% of the salaries and wages earned during the most recent quarter, such that if you decrease the employee's payroll by more than 25%, each dollar above this 25% reduction is a dollar for dollar reduction against your forgiveness amount. And additionally, when calculating the salary reduction adjustment, you do not take into consideration any employees who earned an annual salary in excess of $100,000 or more during 2019. And we'll look through that in the formula uh, that we're going to go through in the example to show you a, a clear example of it. Now, you'll notice you're comparing an eight-week period to a prior quarter here, and the question keep coming comes up is, okay, a quarter is 13 weeks. If I pay somebody their normal salary for eight weeks, eight weeks divided by 13 is 61%. So even if I pay somebody at their same pay rate over this eight week period, I'm not going to pay them 75% of what they earned in a prior quarter. I would tell you, this is one of those questions we're waiting for guidance on and stay tuned because it definitely needs to be addressed. So let's go through an actual forgiveness calculation where I think a lot of what we just talked about will become clear. So what you're seeing now is the potential payroll uh, loan calculation amount. So most people have already gone through this. You take your eligible payroll costs, which include your compensation. You back out employees that made over $100,000. So we're looking at a 2019 12-month period here. We backed out the employees that earn over 100,000. There was three of them. We've added back $300,000 because you can add back 100,000 per employee that's over 100. We then added in our 401k matching contributions and profit sharing contributions. We've added back our state and local taxes assessed. We've added in the component of health insurance that the employer has paid. So we have eligible costs of 3.4 million divide it by 12, multiply it by two and a half, we apply for a loan of 716667, which we received. So now, eight weeks later, let's move into the forgiveness calculation. And the first component is determining our eligible costs. And you'll see we have bucket A, which is our payroll cost, and bucket B, which is our non-payroll cost. And bucket A, you'll see in the eight-week period, we paid $400,000 in gross compensation. Now, in the eight-week period, you're only allowed to pay people an annualized rate of $100,000. And an annualized rate of $100,000 is 15384 for an eight-week period. So what we've done here is we've identified the three employees who earned in excess of that in the eight-week period. We've made an adjustment to bring them down to that $100,000 annual rate. 
Other eligible costs in the payroll bucket are our 401k matching contribution, our health insurance, and our state and local taxes. So in the eight week period, our eligible payroll costs, as you can see, are 529,152. We've then tracked all our non-payroll costs, including our mortgage interest, our rent obligations, our utilities, and you will see that those came out to, in the eight week period, $196,000. So our total allowable costs incurred in the eight-week period were $725,152, which you'll note is in excess of the loan amount. We did that on purpose. But you'll see that our payroll costs were only 73% of the total costs in bucket A and B. Therefore, we have a limiting factor. So even though we've spent $725,152 and our loan is $716,667, we're only allowed maximum allowable expenses is 705.536, and that's the payroll cost, 529.152 divided by 0.75. So our eligible forgiveness amount from the first test of the maximum allowable expenses is 705.536. We then move on to our headcount reduction formula. And how we calculate this is we took our monthly average of full-time employees for the eight-week period, You'll see that we, we track the hours worked. We took the 30 hour ACA work week and we came out with a full time equivalency of 56 employees in that eight week period. And we calculated that um, utilizing full time and part time employees. So if a part time employee worked uh, 15 hours and there were two of them, that constitutes one full time equivalent. We capped our full-time employees at the 30 hours because I don't believe you're going to be able to get uh, the formula to be increased if your full-time employees that are on salary work more than the 30 or 40 hours. So that's our, our numerator. We then calc our denominator by taking the monthly average full-time equivalent employees for the two periods that are pre-pandemic. And we assess that for the period 215 19 through 63019 our full-time equivalency was 62 and for the period January 1st 2020 through February 29th 2020 our full-time equivalency was 58 we take the lower of the two which is 58 we divide our monthly average of full-time equivalent employees for the eight-week period of 56 by 58 and we come up with a formula of about 96% so we multiply our 705536, which was our eligible maximum allowable expenses in the forgiveness formula, times this 96%. And now we have our potential loan forgiveness amount of 68336. We then go on to the salary reduction forgiveness amount formula. And as I said, there's going to be some additional guidance coming out here. But we only look at employees that did not make $100,000 or more in 2019. We've identified three employees. We go to the most recent quarter they worked for us, which would have been March 31st, 2020. We take their payroll for that quarter. We multiply it by our base factor of 0.75. And then we've assessed what their compensation was that they were paid in the eight week period. You can see that they were paid less for employee B and C in the eight week period uh, than the base amount from that first quarter. So therefore we have a dollar for dollar reduction. I believe there's gonna be an adjustment here. I believe they're gonna to want to run this based on an annualized approach to, to correct this issue. But for presentation purposes, we've used the CARES Act language the way it's written. So you will see that we had a potential loan forgiveness amount coming out of the headcount reduction of 68336, but now we have a dollar for dollar reduction of 10,500. So our actual loan forgiveness amount is 669,836. Keeping in mind our original loan amount was 716,667. So we get forgiveness of 669,836. Now we have a loan of 46,831. And now, as we know with that loan, it converts over to a two-year loan. Payments are deferred for the first six months, and then you have 18 equal monthly payments. The interest rate is 1%. There's no guarantee or no collateral required by the company. And um, the amount of the forgiveness is non-taxable uh, non to you as, as income.
just want to throw up once again how that formula was calced so that you can see. Would also stress that people keep saying to me, well, I haven't been able to, uh, to get back to pre-pandemic employee level quickly. Within the CARES Act, there's a lot of language that says if you get back to employee level by June 30, 2020, uh, that forgiveness will be addressed so that you still will be able to get forgiveness. There's going to be additional guidance coming out in the coming weeks, so we bring your attention to that. Do the best you can to bring back employees, but if you can't get back to pre-pandemic levels right away, but you get there by June 30th, the CARES Act does say that there is some forgiveness um, coming. We've talked about the loan provisions earlier. And what I can stress right now is what you can do is create a due diligence file. And why is that? Because we're, we're so in the forest right now and in the trees, we can't see that far away. But two and three years from now, when this all gets looked back upon, we're gonna wanna make sure we did all our due diligence. And as I said, the rules keep changing daily. So uh, my, my fellow coworker, Mike Garcia, just did a great blog on this at, at klr.com, our coronavirus uh, resource center. And he talked about building a due diligence file where you have a copy of your application for the PPP, your supporting documentation, the payroll reports you would need to keep in that file, and the, the copy of the correspondence with the bank. But make sure it's time stamped because as I said, the rules are changing daily. And we'd also suggest that you print out the rules time stamped because the CARES Act says if you follow the rules as they were in place when you applied, you cannot be held accountable if the rules changed. And as I stressed early on, you have to have a need for these funds and you should document now why uh, you took the PPP loan. And, and Mike's blog has a great uh, outline of what should be in that memo. Can't stress enough that you should do that ASAP so you don't forget everything that's fresh in your head. And then I tell you to rinse, wash, and repeat when, when the forgiveness happens because you're going to want to do the same thing, build that, that due diligence file for forgiveness and make sure that years from now when we look back on all this, you've done you know, what a prudent person would do. Uh, so now at this time, I, I want to turn it over to uh, Sean and just remind everybody that, you know, the, the PPP, we're just the stake here, and, and Sean and, and Starkweather and the insurance component is really the sizzle. So, uh, Sean, I'd like to turn it over to you and uh, hear about insurance. Well, thank you, Anthony, and uh, I, I want to thank you again for inviting us to participate on your webinar today. Um, very informative. We appreciate uh, your thought leadership when it comes to the scenario around COVID-19 and the, the PPP. So I'm going to be getting into the insurance impact of COVID-19 and try to have you have a few takeaways based upon my short 20-minute presentation in regards to your business. So I want to go ahead and give you a quick overview of the agenda today. We're going to address the changing business environment, the key coverage discussion around that change in the business environment. We're going to give you an update on the business interruption thoughts around everything related to business interruption. We're also going to be talking about insurance premium and cash flow management. So everyone's business is changing. Anthony mentioned he's performing this webinar from his kitchen table. I'm at home as well. Your businesses have changed completely. Some folks have gone from making whiskey and beer to making hand sanitizer. Manufacturing lines have gone from making widgets to be making PPE, personal protective equipment. Stores are enforcing social distancing standards. So with this changing that are taking place within your business, are you essential? Are you following those requirements from a social distancing perspective? Are you providing your employees the proper PPE? Is human resources in step with the regulatory environment? If you're a healthcare or human service organization, how are you getting your folks to come into work to take care of the, the clients that and the clients that you serve on a daily basis? Other new operations that we're seeing, restaurants in particular, have gone from a dine-in 
environment to a dine out. So in a lot of, a lot of respects from an insurance perspective, we're seeing a significant increase in the delivery component and that exposure to the business. Healthcare, we're seeing a dramatic shift or have seen a dramatic shift to telemedicine rather than in-office visits. Some other things that we're working on or, or looking at from a liability and business environment changing standpoint are the remote workforce. How are we tracking our non-exempt employees? How are we dealing with workers' comp in the new environment? And now that we are nearly all remote, how are our systems handling that? Have we seen an increased data security potential liability? And then top it off, the layoffs and potential furloughs that the businesses are going through. So I'd like you to just think about it from the standpoint of risk management planning. Now that you're in this scenario, what does your emergency response or preparedness plan look like? Are you effectively communicating your strategies to your employees? Obviously, they're going to be, you know, fearful of what's going on with the virus and coming to work or working from home. So what's your communication strategy? Is it constant? Is, are you touching or talking to them once a week? Another big element, employee training. Just because our folks are remote, potentially, or potentially they're still essential employees, what training are we offering them? So if they're essential employees, are they using the personal protective equipment properly? Have we trained them properly? Have we trained them on proper social distancing if we're a manufacturing operation? Those are the items that I think most businesses should focus in on from a risk management standpoint at this time. Changes in operations. Do you have a greater exposure to liability? So we mentioned some of the manufacturers that have switched operations to making the PPE or hand sanitizer or other, or other needed items at this time. Have you addressed that scenario from the standpoint of your insurance program and the liability that you may now face? Are you signing new contractual agreements to do and offer different programs as we speak? Have those been reviewed by your attorneys and your insurance broker? Very important steps that I think are, are fundamental to a good risk management plan at this time. And again, just to summarize this, have you discussed the impact of the insurance program, or impact of the virus on the insurance program? So with all those different exposures, changes, and basically your risk management planning, what are some of the coverages that you want to think about and discuss as you move forward that may be impacted or you may have to use as a result of the virus. So we did a little punch list here of some coverages that maybe you're not thinking of that could apply uh, to a virus situation. Most nonprofits, most publicly traded companies are going to be purchasing directors and officers liability. Some for-profit businesses privately held also do purchase directors and officers liability. That policy may come into play because of the decisions the management makes and the response to the COVID outbreak. Another coverage that we've already seen come into play and seen claims filed pretty frequently is the employment practices liability. That's the coverage part that's designed to respond to workplace bullying, discrimination, and or harassment suits related to employees' employer relations. Now, this is a big topic for us when we're talking about COVID because of all the things that are going on around furlough, furloughs, laying off employees, potentially uh, you have essential employees coming into work and you're setting up a protocol based upon taking temperatures, doing certain things to assure that these folks aren't sick when they're coming to work. If you go ahead and, and make a blanket statement and say, well, we're not allowing X employee to come into work, potentially that could be a discrimination suit. If you furlough someone versus someone else, you could have a discrimination suit. And we are seeing these. So from my standpoint, again, from a risk management standpoint, proper planning, speaking to your employment counsel, speaking to your insurance broker, making sure the policies that you have in place align with the EEOC guidelines that we're seeing been put out. We'll go ahead and get that article from the EEOC onto our Starkweather COVID page, and you'll have access to that. So you can take a look at that in more detail. But again, 
as you implement the screening, self-quarantine, and remote work environments, it's important to do it consistently. If we single out any specific groups, that's when we could potentially have a claim on our employment practice liability policy. I'm sure a lot of the folks on the phone are Rhode Island-based companies or have Rhode Island-based operations. Gina Raimondo, the governor, uh, came out Friday afternoon and made an announcement in relation to workers' compensation. And she made a blanket statement basically saying that healthcare workers will have access and have the right to claim workers' compensation benefits in the state of Rhode Island. Um, this is a moving, dynamic topic. We are getting updates every hour on this topic. Beacon Mutual is one of the carriers that is predominantly interpreting that uh, order by the governor. Currently, how we understand it, and more to come on this in the following days, we understand it that this is applying specifically to frontline healthcare workers. Let's think doctors, nurses, test takers, folks in the ICU emergency room that are working day, day to day with active COVID patients. If there is other employers that have a COVID situation and an employee becomes exposed, we're being told as of now, and things can change, as I mentioned, at any time, but as we're being told now, if it's incidental contact, most likely they will not be able to claim workers' compensation benefits in that scenario if they're outside of that specific group of frontline healthcare workers. But I believe there'll be some more clarity on that as we go into the next days ahead. Another update from a management standpoint, when you're thinking about what's going on with the workforce that's remote, cyber liability. Most businesses now, hopefully, have looked into at least purchasing the cyber liability, have an idea of the cost, or have it in place. But as we work remotely, the exposures that we face from a cyber liability standpoint have drastically increased. We're seeing hackers around the globe exploiting the hysteria surrounding the virus, sending out emails just like Anthony and I sent out for this webinar. Looks just like it came from us, and we have a webinar, so you want to get on it, you click on it. Oops. It's a malicious code, and now your system has potentially been hacked. In that scenario, if we have a liability claim related to someone's personally identifiable information being exposed to a third party, we'd have coverage under a cyber liability policy. If our system is locked down and potentially we need a ransom scenario, the policy would also respond there as well. It also will respond to any business interruption that we do face because of the hack that does take place. The other item I wanted to add to this list that's not on it would be fiduciary liability. A lot of uh, folks on the phone will buy fiduciary liability. And basically that's designed to respond to employee benefits plans and retirement plan related suits. We all probably remember from 2008 that we had some fiduciary liability suits around the 401k or 403b plans and, and the fees associated with the plans and we saw some employees suing employers because they felt that they were paying absorbent fees. Well, the market is volatile again, so you're starting to see those claims potentially come into play. But it also applies to, as I mentioned, health plan-related uh, employee benefit claims. So as we talk about furloughed employees, laid-off employees, potentially staying on the health benefits or not staying on the health benefits, potentially we could see some litigation and some lawsuits come from this. I'm sure plaintiff firms will be looking for companies with high plan fees at this time, limited plan diversity options as well. Um, so again, that's one of the key coverages that I, I wanted to bring to your attention here today on the webinar. So again, I, I'm pretty confident that most of you have heard some element of this story around business income insurance and a, uh, the coverage related to the COVID outbreak. And I'm sure most of you have heard this same conversation. Based upon the policy language, most insurers have taken the position that claims related to COVID-19 are not covered and have issued denials for the folks that have filed claims already. The justification is that no physical damage to the property exists, which is, is a required trigger of, of the coverage, and or because the policy expressly excluded coverages for viruses. So I don't think that's new to a lot of the folks on the phone but I wanted just to refresh us on that. The current state of the law does not give us favor, favorable terms of recovery for the business interruption, as we mentioned. 
but it is possible that things could change. It is possible we could see an expansion of the coverage and businesses should take steps now in case that occurs. Document documentation is key if something does change. So when I was listening to Anthony and he was talking about, hey, you have to document, you have to have your separate file. Well, it's my advice that you do this here for the business income conversation as well. And it kind of aligns pretty well with what Anthony is, is having you document anyways. So again, when you're doing your documentation, add a business income file because you're gonna need to do that because of the fact we've seen, I don't know, I, I think it was two Fridays ago, I had uh, President Trump's uh, news conference on and he did about a 15 minute monologue on why he felt insurance from a business income standpoint should respond and should afford coverage. Uh, and then at the end he said, but you gotta look at the exclusions. So again, it's top of mind for a lot of people. Congress folks are also asking for insurers to cover COVID-19 losses. We've also seen individual state legislatures taking up bills to force payment of insurance. So my update here is, as of now, we do not feel that there's coverage afforded under the business income insurance for most of the folks that are uh, looking at business income losses. But in this dynamic environment, it would not surprise me if something changes. The other thing that we're seeing out there from a business income standpoint is currently there is a, uh, a, a coverage platform, the government backstops called TRIA, the Terrorism Risk and Insurance um, Act. You could see something like that from an epidemic standpoint in the future. So again, as we move forward out of this, that's probably where this coverage is going to lie. So if it ever does happen again, it'll be a federally backed program that would respond. Should I file a should I still file a claim? You know, have a thoughtful discussion with your broker. Again, we talked about it's unknown if the federal or state programs will require a denial from an insurer. Start whether we're monitoring the situation and we will keep our clients updated uh, via phone calls or emails or on our COVID specific website. If in doubt, report the claim. Only the insurer can accept or deny if the claim is, is a viable claim. As we move into the insurance premium cash flow management, I'm sure a lot of the people on the phone today have seen the commercials from a personal line standpoint where most personal lines insurance carriers are offering some sort of discount related to automobile coverage for the months of April and, and May. We haven't um, seen that dramatically uh, on the commercial side, but we have seen selective issues. Selective Insurance Company has mentioned that they are going to be doing a 15% savings. And when the carriers do this, this is going to be behind the scenes and you'll automatically receive that savings. You don't need to, to call us or your broker and say, hey, did we get that? Because it can automatically happen. The other conversation around cash flow management, paying premiums. Governors in certain states, I know Connecticut is one, who has issued a 60-day grace period for premium payments. So they're, they're, they're not allowing insurance carriers to cancel you for non-payment. Some ca carriers are doing that on their own, deferring payments until June or sometime after May. They're waiving late fees, suspending non-compliance notices for the audits because obviously you can't do a lot of the audits at this time. My, my comment here is most likely you're going to have to pay the premium. So even if you defer it, just remember when June comes around or July comes around, they're just going to require you to pay uh, basically three installments of, of your payment plan at that point. So just keep that in mind. The other really big element for me around this topic is related to changes in under underwriting exposures, payroll, sales figures, inventory. That is something that we are advising all our clients to really take a good look at and see if we can make some changes here. I know I had a business that uh, unfortunately had to shut down completely and they had two large installment payments coming up on their workers compensation they were about 75 percent of the uh, through the year of their policy term so what we were able to do instead of just deferring those payments and getting the carrier to do that we worked with the carrier to lower their payroll exposures by 30 percent and basically at that point they were paid off for the year if for some reason they get back in business earlier that'd be great and we would change the payroll at audit. Workers' compensation, same, same as we talked about, really, really important for you to do that. 
a couple things to think about. If our employees have changed roles, potentially we could change classifications. So if somebody was, for example, a, a host or a hostess at a restaurant and now they're delivering, that's going to be a different classification for workers' compensation and an increased uh, rate for that code. Something to think about. Work from home. Can I claim workers' compensation if I work from home? The answer is yes. Uh, we just have to justify that you were working at the time when the incident occurred. Furloughed employees, pay payroll conversation. NCCI, which is the rating uh, agency that handles most states' workers' compensation rules and procedures, has made it clear that they plan to introduce to each state uh, rules and regs around furloughed employees' payroll. So if you're paying someone to just stay home and they're not working, we feel that NCCI will make a change that will allow that payroll not to be counted on your workers' compensation premium. So I appreciate the time, and we're going to go into uh, your question answered section. Well, thanks, Sean. Uh, very informative information on the insurance side. Uh, we're going to jump into some questions now, and I'm going to try to go through as many as possible and go through um, uh, them pretty quickly. If you have any follow-up, please, as I said, reach out. So a uh, question came up quite a bit. Can you use a portion of your loan? Uh, and then pay back the rest. Yes. So there is no prepayment penalty on this this loan. Remember that the, you're certifying with this loan that you you're looking to retain and maintain your employees. Um, so if you use the funds for anything outside of the eligible expenses, you can be held accountable by the the federal government. Um, you know. Next question is from a dentist. Uh, business is prohibited from from working because of local and state and local government restrictions. Um, should the PPP be dispersed prior to uh, people coming back and work? And I'd say yes. The spirit of this law and the intent of this law is to keep people off unemployment and bring them back to work. And even if you're paying them, as, as Sean just mentioned, to sit home in some cases, or you can find additional work for them. So I encourage, in the case of a dentist, you know, I keep hearing. On, on these calls with uh, national speakers that uh, everybody knows how to paint. So if, if you need to do painting, bring your people in and have them, have them do some painting or have them reach out to your customers. This, this is a time where you, you can use the uh, captivated audience to, to market to them. Um, and, and the goal of this program, and I've heard this several times from the SBA, is to keep individuals getting a pay. And if the business gets a secondary benefit because the payroll is being covered by the government, that's a secondary benefit. That's not the primary goal of this program. The primary goal is to keep employees tied to the business so that when we get past this, they come back to work, the workforce is intact, the team is intact, and to keep them able to pay their bills while we go through this. Um, this is not necessarily a, a tax question or a, or a loan question. This is more of a financial reporting is the forgiveness of the loan accounted for below the line as uh, non-operational or extraordinary and unusual? Um, we have had we have had a lot of questions um, put out to various banks because we also think this is going to impact covenants, and we've heard that they're already considering calling out with on the financial statements the amount of. Uh, funds that are canceled, canceled from the loan program here, and it, it will not factor into your uh, your loan covenants, including because some people will pe keep people on payroll and incur expenses that they would have normally reduced those expenses, and it may make them fail the covenant. Uh, we, we think there's going to be some sort of reporting to kind of carve out the expenses to normalize operations. Um, So, Sean, this is more of a, uh, um, I think, insurance yes. question. <laughs> yeah, I'll uh, I'll take it from here on, on this slide. And the first question looks to be asking about reopening. And again, as we move to the stage reopening that seems to be hopefully taking place in the near future, um, we're not going to be going back to the new normal, as, as the question kind of alludes to. So, how do we protect the folks that are most 
at risk of being affected by the, the COVID virus and, and how do we avoid discrimination claims as a result of it. So this goes back to my conversation earlier about employment practice liability and the risk management around making sure you're not you know, potentially discriminating against one population versus another. So again, my advice first, speak with your HR um, professional that you have employed, make sure they're understanding the regs and the rules around this. I would strongly uh, suggest you check out the EEOC article, what you should do, know about COVID-19 and the ADA and Rehabilitation Act and other EEO laws. We'll post that on the COVID site. But I would also reach out to your trusted advisor from an employment law standpoint and ask their opinion on that as well. Again, I think from my standpoint, the takeaway is whatever you do, be consistent and don't treat people differently. And if you do it and you act in good faith, that should that should be the way to go. But again, make sure you, you reach out to those key stakeholders in the conversation. Second question. This is an accounting question. Our, <laughs> yeah, we've received our PPP it. money. Yeah. Um, we've received our PPP money. We need to recall our, our furloughed or our laid off employees and, and some don't want to come back. There's an additional $600 in a federal unemployment benefit that's paid to them through July 31st. And, and some people are not coming back. They're refusing the return to work request. Um, in, in Rhode Island and Massachusetts, if somebody refuses the return to work request, you need to notify the Department of Labor and Training and their benefits will cease. Um, you know, the thing you also need to educate your, your returning employees is that $600 is only through July 31st. And if they're on health insurance and they have to buy their own health insurance, that's expensive. And that when we get through this, you want to make sure they have a job to come back to and that you don't have to go out and find replacement employees. Um, next question is a insurance question, but I will throw in, it says I started a new product outside of the scope of uh, my product and operation. Should I let my insurance carry know of this change? And I'll let Sean answer that, but before he does, I would say also let your accountant know because you may be eligible for an R&D tax credit. <laughs> yeah, ab absolutely. Um, we're, again, we're seeing this. We mentioned it earlier in, the, in our part where people are, are, are making key, key products for, for, for the people out there, and they've, they've changed their business model completely. So, again, from my standpoint, absolutely, you need to let your broker and the insurance carrier know to make sure they're willing to stay on that exposure. In some cases, we've had to go ahead and place specific liability policies for the new operation outside the current portfolio of coverages because it was so different from what they were making before. Okay, uh, rapid fire. How do I make sure I maximize how much of my loan is forgiven? Uh, planning, planning, planning. Utilize uh, the, the spreadsheets that uh, I've prepared, um, as well as talk to your advisor. Um, can a sole proprietor with no employees apply for a PPP loan? Yes, they can. Uh, interim final rule number three covers that in detail at the U.S. Treasury uh, website. Is the loan forgiveness amount calculated only for eight weeks of payroll, rent, and utility support? Can it stretch further? At this time, no. It's eight weeks or through June 30th. Um, what do you think is the impact COVID-19 is going to have going back to business as usual? Is there an impact on my insurance renewals? Uh, Sean, I know you covered that. You want to yeah, on it, it again? Yeah, absolutely. Just, just a quick comment is this is going to have a very large impact yet to be determined on, on what it's going to be. But again, if the insurance carriers are required to pay some of the business interruption claims, all bets are off because of the impact that's going to have on those individual insurance carriers. So more to come as we get closer to the 7-1 renewal date for most of the, uh, a, a lot of folks out there, we'll know a lot more. If someone does get COVID that is an employee, how do I handle that from a reporting standpoint? I, I would tell you, um, more importantly, you need to have a, a good HR person working for you. Our uh, HR people as well, I know Sean said the same thing. Our HR people have been acting as uh, advisors as well. And um, I would tell you to, to speak with your HR person. Um, can we include monthly consulting fees paid to one employee who has chosen to be a 1099 employee rather than on payroll? No. Um, can the employer's portion of Social Security and Medicare payments be used to calculate the loan? Uh, no. 
Any suggestions to deal with payroll costs for employees furloughed or laid off prior to the submission of PPP loan? As I've said, the, um, the goal of this program is not to help the benefit, it's to keep the employees getting their payroll. So any, anything prior where you paid the employees and did not get production out of them, the government looks at it and says, well, we're now paying you to pay your employees and you'll get production out of them over the next eight weeks potentially. So there's a flip to that formula and you'll get the benefit in the future. Um, when does the meter stop for the PPP after proceeds are received? It, it's when the funds hit your bank account, you have eight weeks. Now, if you're in the middle of a week for payroll, so let's say you get your funds on Wednesday and you you know, you can't recall your employees back to work on Wednesday. It's going to take a couple of days as well as to start the payroll. We have seen uh, confirmation from the SBA that they're saying we understand if you have to start the following Monday because you received your proceeds during the week, the prior Wednesday. That's not in an authoritative document yet, but we have heard the SBA say that. Um, we've already covered incentivizing employees to return to work. You can pay them more in this eight week period. Uh, you can, there's nothing in the law that says you haven't. Um, Self-employed people and calculating forgiveness, um, nothing yet, stay tuned. And we've covered uh, that it's only the employee portion of FICA, which is included in the loan forgiveness, not employer. The loan cannot be delayed if you're a seasonal business at this time. And I would direct you to sba.gov or treasury.gov for additional information. Uh, we talked earlier about the penalty for not getting to 75%. It, it's, we believe it's a reduction in your forgiveness formula. Uh, you are allowed to rehire, or in the case if somebody does not want to come back, you can replace employee headcount. The formula is based upon headcount as well as salaries, not the same employees. Um, so, uh, going through a couple of these questions, but I want to be aware of the time. Uh, we'll, we'll post the answers to our questions. Actually, we'll, we'll take care of that afterward. Um, at this time, I want to just stress, once again, you're certifying that you're retaining and you're maintaining employees. And I just want to, you know, allow me to say that, that KLR and Stockwood and Shepley have, have an amazing team that advises uh, within our ranks. If you know anything about icebergs, you know that, you know, Sean and I are or what you can see, but under the water is a much larger uh, mass that, you know, that describes our, our teams and, and they're the ones propping us up. Our marketing teams headed by uh, June and June Landry and Ashley Brown at KLR and Stefan Patrol at Stockwell and Shepley, directly responsible for helping pull this together today. Um, specifically our KLR Rapid Response Committee, uh, Mike Garcia and Nick Kay have been doing tons of research I encourage you to go to our, our website and our Coronavirus Research uh, Resource Center where you can find our blogs as well as additional information. And I know that StockWeb has posted some information as well on their website that can assist you. And, you know, I just want to remind everybody that uh, failure we can do alone, but uh, success always takes help. So please reach out and uh, thank you for your time and attention today and take it away, Ashley. Thank you, Anthony and Sean. That was an awesome overview. Um, that pretty much wraps up the time we have for questions. Thanks again, everyone, for joining us. As I mentioned before, we'll be sending out a recording of the webinar and a link to the slides later this afternoon. Um, and as Anthony mentioned, Kaylar has created a Coronavirus Resource Center, and the link is right here on this slide. Um, and we're updating this daily with new information, so be sure to check that out. Um, and also we have two upcoming webinars that our sister company Envision Technology Advisors is hosting. The first is on April 29th. It's Reclaiming Lost Ground, Securing Against Data Leakage and Cyber Risk in the Wake of COVID-19. Um, and Dan Andrea, who's our partner of our Information Securities Group, will be on that panel. We also have one coming up on May 6th and it's titled Rebuilding Your Workforce, Stronger, Better, and More Agile. And Christine Scaffaroni, who is our CHRO uh, from KLR will be on that panel. So you can register on the KLR website for those and we'll be sending out an invitation later this week. So keep an eye out for that. Uh, Stark Weather and Shepley remains committed to providing the best in class insurance services and claims management during this time. And they want you to know that the carrier will make the coverage determination based on all claims and SNS will act as an advocate on your behalf. 
But for more information, please visit their website. Their link is here as well for their coronavirus uh, information. Um, and you can either visit that or uh, file a claim for a service request. And we understand truly that navigating all of this information on the CARES Act and the programs available to you and your business can be overwhelming. And please feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions. Anthony and Sean's contact information is right here. We're here to help. So thank you everyone. Stay safe and thanks again for joining us. Have a great day.